So my first guest today is a true 80s legend with a, a musical career spanning 50 years and his fingerprints all over one of the most recognisable Christmas, anthem, uh, Christmas anthems ever recorded. Having journeyed through an array of projects including Visage, Rich Kids and Ultravox, this frontman is here with a new tour celebrating the electronic sounds that he helped pioneer. So with such a long uh, storied career, I was really looking forward to chatting to him and being transported back to an era of long trench coats, big hair and sweeping synthesizers. His voice and visions tour will arrive in Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen from the 18th until the 20th of May. So I started by asking Midjur about the concept behind the show. Well, it's looking at the uh, the two Ultravox albums that followed on from the Vienna album. I did the Vienna album on the previous tour, the prior tour to this, uh, the, the 1980 tour. I did the Vienna album and I did the first Visage album. Both came out around 1980 and the response was so great on social media people requested these two albums can you do the follow-on so it's the Rage and Eden album and the Quartet album and the poor tour has been postponed twice because of Covid um, so it's, it's been a long time coming <laughs> but we're concentrating on those two records uh, and uh, and peppering it all with the, the songs that people would expect to hear any the songs that I wouldn't be allowed out of the town if I didn't play yeah exactly and that must be so important I guess over the years you've realised that there are just those those huge hits and the fans I guess it's just that emotional connection with the fans isn't it you know you, you and those songs are part of their life well I, I think so yeah I mean it's just the same way uh, it's t- it took me a long time to understand it that people responded to things that I've done the same way I respond to things that other people have done. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the, my my life's peppered, like everyone's, peppered with, with bits of music that when you hear them randomly, not only do you know all the words, uh, you, but you can instantly remember who you were hanging out with and who you fancied and what you were wearing and what you were doing at school and, you know, all of those things. And music does that. I mean, it took me a long time to understand that anything I've done maybe does that to other people as well. Yeah. Um, so there's an, el- an element of that. But also, I think there's an element of, if you just say to, you did a random Vox Pop and said, you know, name me an Ultravox, 10 Ultravox songs, they'd say Vienna, Dance with Tears, Mize, Vienna, Dance with Tears, Mize, and keep going. <laughs> because that's the perception that you know, Vienna was the only thing that was ever done. And you've got to understand that a horrible realisation a few years back was that 50% of the audience that you're playing to probably doesn't, want to be there Mm -hmm. and they only know Vienna so because they've been dragged along by their significant other half so you have to kind of you know keep them entertained as well as the ones who know everything you've ever done yeah and how do you feel about being back on the road then certainly as we said that there's been a bit of a hiatus for for most musicians oh the the hiatus for all of us uh, was was horrendous I mean for anyone doing any live uh, performance stuff you know actors or dancers or, or musicians um, it was a double whammy because not only could we not go and see someone else, but the uh, the part of our major part of our lives is performing. So we couldn't do that either. So during lockdown, although I kept my sanity because I, I could still carry on writing and recording, I had a recording facility. The idea that something I'd done since I was 13 or 14, you know, go out and perform live yeah. was you know, taken away uh, and might not come back, which was the scary part. Yes, yes. Um, and I, I, I thought, hold on, I, I've taken this for granted all my life and I never saw a moment where it's out the window, it's not going to happen. Um, so the appreciation of being able to go back out and be in a crowd of people, be in the same room, mm-hmm. have that mass experience, whether you're on stage or watching the stage, that is just glorious. I can't express it enough. Yeah, and uh, I presume performing in Scotland, there's a, there's an extra free song for you. <laughs> just just a touch. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, it's 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 um, it's always a, an absolute joy coming back over. You know, I had to, I had to leave in, in search of a career, a bit like Dick Whittington, <laughs> uh, to go to London when everything was London centric back in the <clears throat> in the mid seventies, seventy six, seventy seven. Uh, and of course, once you get embroiled in the in the you know, living down south, you're kind of stuck there. But coming back is always an absolute joy. Uh, I mean, I, d- I do come back, and when I get to to Glasgow, I, I go and walk around the streets that I used mm-hmm. to walk around as a kid, uh, and, and remind myself that I got what I wished for. Yeah. Uh, because it's very easy to take everything everything for granted, and I've been stupidly lucky 
in my career where I've managed to sustain the highs and lows and the peaks and troughs and I'm still here doing it and still loving doing it, you know. What do you think is the secret to that? Is it just having your head screwed on? Maybe not, you know, getting too carried away when, you know, you're enjoying extreme success because obviously we know there have been casualties of that so many times over the years. I've had my moments. I'm sure you have. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's a, it's a um, you know success and fame is a is a heady drug, and it's very easy to go over the edge. And I've I've met quite a few people who are, had told me I was uh, a bit like a dictator, uh, expecting everyone to have the same input and passion about what I was doing that I had. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I've realised that yes, I probably was. I'm probably pushing people too hard and too far because I wanted everything to be perfect. And of yeah. course, the world isn't perfect, and you don't have to do that. So you kind of mellow over the years. Yeah, it's uh, uh, you know, it's you know, I think that the joy of you know being able to still go out and do it to a reasonable level. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can still sing and I can still play my guitar and I can still love it. And I don't feel the the uh, the, the desire to, to retire. It's one of the questions I get all the time. You know, are you thinking <laughs> no. of retiring? They think, well, surely you retire from something that you really don't like doing to yeah. do something you do like. Yeah. We're the lucky ones. We get to do something we love. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And just think, thinking about you know, keeping the voice uh in tune, if you like. I know that somebody like Annie Lennox, for example, you know, she takes it very seriously. You know, she does her, her exercises every day, her vocal exercise. What about you? Because that is something to think about. And I suppose it is you know, part of getting older as well. You maybe have to pay more attention to it. Well, you again, you'd think that I would, um, or, or I should, <laughs> or I have, um, and I don't. Uh, I've, I've just been stupid and just walk on stage and just belt it out during... Uh, lockdown uh, when that previous tour was was cut short in Australia mm-hmm. uh, uh, and a year after not finishing the tour we were given the opportunity to do uh, one of these kind of live broadcast things you know in a, in a, a distance room just to cameras and then stream it around the world and I thought great so I went straight into rehearsals and did what I normally do to find that I had no voice because I hadn't sung. I hadn't sung properly for a year. I hadn't warmed up. I hadn't done anything. That must and be terrifying, thought, actually, was it? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's the equivalent of oh. trying to run a marathon yeah. without training. You know, it's a muscle like anything else. And the muscle, if it's not in use, you know, just goes flobby and just doesn't work. And my voice, my voice said, no, <laughs> you're not going there. And I had to work at it. I had to go back. And at that point, I was petrified because I thought that was really it over. But, it, of course being sensible about it and working it out. And, and, and I should listen to Annie and maybe she should take a few, <laughs> few warm-up tricks. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it is fascinating, all of that. And in terms of the show then, give us, tell us a little bit more about what people can expect then. Well, it's, uh, as I said, it, it hinges around these two albums. I, 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 in my ridiculous mind, I thought it would be easy, I'll just pop back, download these albums because I didn't actually own them. I'd signed everything and given it all away. Uh, and learn the songs and just do those two albums. And, of course, you go back 40 years, it's like being in the TARDIS, and you go back and you think, I'm not even sure that I was in Ultravox at that point um, because I don't <laughs> recognise some of the stuff that I'm singing. I don't understand. I, I'm a different person. You know, you you, you, you grow, you know, you, you change, and your ideas and your ideals change. And uh, and I just thought, I can't sing some of these. No, I just don't mm. want to. I don't want to stand on stage pretending that they're doing something for me. But equally so, I found other things that I was absolutely overjoyed with that, uh, that still resonated, that still worked, and still worked, more importantly, in a live sense. Which so ones were cherry- those? Uh, well, you know, things like, you know, the title track of Rage in Eden, which is a very dark, mm. ominous, you know, haunting, cinematic thing. Uh, that works uh, beautifully uh, on stage. And it's a, a lovely juxtaposition from the, the, the kind of the full-on synth guitar rock ones that we do, you know, the up ones. So I've cherry-picked from those two albums. And then, of course, the whole thing is peppered with, the, as I say, mm-hmm. the songs the songs that the, the, the poor other half who's been dragged along will know. <laughs> and have you seen, when you're out on tour, do you see, uh, is, is it quite a wide age range? Because I'm thinking that you know, there'll be the kind of uh, older folk uh, obviously, who were there first time around through all the trajectory of your career, because you know that's multifaceted, as, as we said. But did they bring the wains along as well? Is there a younger generation coming along? There is because they discover music in a different way. They don't discover music on the radio. You know, my my, I've got four daughters, 
And they don't listen to the radio, very rarely. Yeah. They find a piece of music on a film or a television show or whatever, and then they, you know, do it on social media. They send mm -hmm. it to the friends. And, and, and just look what happened with Kate Bush recently, you know, the, yeah. the whole thing about, you know, they, they find your music on, you know, soundtracks or they find them on, you know, video games. There's a, there's a great thing that happened uh, recently, uh, 10 years ago. I think Ultravox got back together again to, to go out and play those songs one more time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and a, a, a Japanese uh, guy uh, turned up with his entourage and he designed the game, video game, Metal Gear Solid. And he came and he said, I want to make the entire final installment of this game based around your version of David Bowie's Man Who Sold the World. Wow. And I had done this version for a while. And I, I kind of went, yeah, okay. You know, <laughs> not expecting anything to come of it. The next game comes out a year later and it's all based on this song. Good so God. the people who've discovered this song, absolutely no idea what a mid -year is or <laughs> any of my background or any of it. I'm, I'm, I'm ageless. I've got loads of hair in their head. Uh, <laughs> And they find it because of the music. Then they go and look you up and they discover a world of music that they've now fallen in love with. So the answer is yes. There is a, there's yeah. a younger, newer audience who come along. That's so interesting because it, I guess a lot of people felt that, you know, that the age of, you know, uh, people being able to get, you know, big long-term record company contracts and all of that has changed. I mean, obviously, the music business has changed so much and uh, there'd been a lot of negativity about it. But actually what you're talking about is the positive of the sort of pick and mix generation discovering music that they would never have discovered because it's just, it's all out there. It is all out there, but it's, it's a, you, you kind of have to look for it, you know, and mm -hmm. you do have to be lucky. Uh, luck's a massive, a massive uh, role in, in anyone's career. Uh, so if you're lucky enough to get a piece of music in a, in a TV sync or a, on an advert or whatever, not necessarily written for those things, but just used, just placed in there, people might find you. Uh, you know, the world's a, uh, it's a very different musical world now. Everyone has the tools, yeah. you know, to, to, to make the music. You give everyone the same tools. The person with an idea will come up with something great. What do your daughters then think of your success of, of dad? Well, I think they're probably um, quietly proud mm -hmm. uh, when they were younger. And I used to get dragged along to, you know, the school Christmas play and they'd ask me to sit and sing Do They Know It's Christmas at them. They hated it, <laughs> quite rightly so. You know, absolutely, and and they should be. Um, but you know, I think they're they're quietly proud. Are any of them showing musical ambitions, following in dad's footsteps? Well, my eldest daughter Molly was in the band for a while. Yeah. Uh, she's done done a bit of that. Um, a band called the Faders, mm. um, but she she wised up. <laughs> it's a very different industry, <laughs> and she went to the dark side. She she worked as an agent for a while. Uh -huh. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Because yeah, you'll have, yeah, you'll yeah, have insights they, into all that side of the business as well. You well, know. I'm, I'm, I've got more insights now that she's worked on that side of the business. Ah. I thought they were on our side, but then again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, so so basically, um, but as you said, coming back to Scotland, always uh, that extra wee sort of thrill for you. And in terms of what's happening on stage, can you tell us a little bit more about, about that, what the setup is for you? Yeah, so we're a four-piece band. Um, we have a, a thing called a silent stage. Uh, because of technology, uh, instead of having, you know, 25 keyboards on stage like the the last gig we did with Ultravox, um, the sound sources come from laptops. You know, all the synth yes. sounds all come from laptops on stage. So we've got you know, a couple of keyboard setups, electronic drum kit, even the guitar has no amplifier or speaker. It's all processed. So what comes out out front is the ultimate hi-fi sound. Yes. Because uh, there's no sound coming off stage at all, except me squawking my <laughs> my, my croaky voice if Annie doesn't give me some, some warm-up lessons. So yeah, that's the only acoustic thing you'll hear, that and the violin, maybe. That's interesting, isn't it? I mean, that is a sea change, totally. Um, did it take you a while to adjust to that, or are you just kind of like, no, this is great, actually, because what's so most important is the sound? Yeah, the, what, what is most important is the sound. I mean, it, it, it avoids, you know, hopefully avoids feedback and things like that and and spill and mushiness um and, and it's technology that's in, enabled it you know I, tr I tried to do it 20 years ago and the technology wasn't quite there to pull it off so that's great and of course the the lights you know we we work yeah. a lot you know with a lighting engineer hand in hand to kind of help create the atmospheres to and and uh, you know and that enhance the music Indeed, indeed. Oh, look, we're looking forward to you coming to Scotland, Midge. I hope you, you and the, the, the band enjoy it. And thanks very much for talking to me today.
an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. There you go, Midge. You're talking to me about the Voice and Visions Tour, celebrating 40 years since the release of Ultravox's Rage in Eden and Quartet albums. Maybe you're going to go and see him, Midge and the Band, or Edinburgh's Usher Hall tomorrow night, the Glasgow Barrowland on Thursday, and Aberdeen Music Hall on Saturday. Here he is with If I Was.